Exactly what I want to be at all times, and you can't stop me because that's called free will. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? I don't know. You know anymore. that kind of like that kind of argument, oh, or something similar to that, just reminds me of how like there was a nice comeback. Um, it's like I'm not gonna do what you're telling me to do because guess what? You're not my parent. If I was your parent, I would have done a better job raising you. Yeah. Ooh. yeah. Ooh, ouch. <laughs> Clearly Bliss is fine with me being her mom, though, so that's a whole thing. Uh, please. <laughs> ah, please? Oh, okay, fine, ow! sir. Okay, yeah. if you really want to beg me for it, I'll be your mom. Oh my god. <laughs> Mama Bliss confirmed. Alright, to be fair, to be fair. Uh, I don't like to lead people. I don't like to be in charge. I'm capable. just don't like to. Too much of a chore. Understandable. So, um, I just want it's, you to realize by... It's not even so much as that it's a chore, it's the, um, it's the responsibility. Yeah. Understandable. The most I aspire to is someone's number two. Like, even in video games. Yeah. And as, and as it clearly shows, uh, when I'm under a great deal of stress, I do break down. Myth have seen this. Yeah. You're very cuddly, by the way. Of course I'm cuddly. Yes, yes. Can confirm. Um, I haven't experienced it as much as Solar, but I agree. You are you are a very sweet person, IRL. Yeah. I, I meant yeah. Cause, yeah for, so just so, so the chat has context during BronyCon, I was probably Myth unfortunately caught me at my worst time, but I guess it was like perfectly tied because oh, Myth is here. I'm gonna cry on your shoulder now. Aww. <laughs> And you got the comforts, and it was okay, and then we went to Starbucks. piece of shit! Yes. Yeah, um, what happened to me was, uh, I got cookies, and then I got kissed in a- and then I think we hugged at one point. Antidote. That right, was good. nice. I think at some point, yeah. That was nice. You know what's funny? Because I kissed you on the cheek, uh, <laughs> that's what led to my first kiss with Solar. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Yeah, I know. I th wait, I think you told me about this a long time ago, but refresh yeah. the story because it's been a while. Because okay. he saw that happen, he's like, oh, you're racking him up, huh? And then I texted him, hey, you can have a kiss on the cheek, too, if you want. And then he's like, oh, I might take one for myself. Then he took an Sorry. actual kiss, not one on the cheek. <laughs> and I'm like, Honestly, that was 100% based to that entire experience. It felt pretty good. Like being collected from a... Beautiful siren, a mushroom, Just, a poisonous there was cat no formed fear. from a subterraneous <laughs> mushroom I'm tower. I'm so confused. I'm like, did that really just fucking happen? <laughs> <laughs> Am I not just daydreaming? <laughs> that actually happened in a crowd of people. <laughs> God damn it. No, I'm, I'm no, just I'm reminiscing. It it. No, no, I'm just I'm just going through memories. memories yeah, now. we are all experiencing the vibe. Um, I mean, like, what else was I doing? Uh, you were helping to keep my sanity at the table. I remember that. Oh right, yeah. yeah. No, there are times where um, when I talk about like my first times meeting people or first times doing stuff with people, I often have to preface like my first time. As like, I need to I need to like strongly emphasize I didn't make it up, and then I'm like, okay, I have to, be because there was a lot that actually went my way on it. It was like this seems like something more out of someone's fanfic, which is say too good to be true. So I'm just gonna every time I decide I'm gonna tell someone, I have to preface it with that. <laughs> I like oh, Alistair Crowley's. I think I like what Alistair Crowley said. The, the point isn't to live in, impossibly, it's to live It's to live so fully that people would not believe the truth anyway. I like that. That is crazy. Mm. Yeah, and my first time was one of those moments, so, and I am low-key flexing that, because I think that's what we're doing right now. That's like, nice. It's a sentiment. Like, isn't there a phrase somewhere, do not fear death, fear the unlived life? Yes. Oh my god, I agree with that completely. Mm -hmm. He's got the bleakness and 
bad idea. I mean, if it weren't for that thing, I might not have gone to BronyCon, because I was afraid. Oh, but see, you got something out of it, and it was rewarding. Yeah. yeah. Also, just another thing to notice, the most worthwhile life experiences, the most wisdom, and the thing that allows you to relate most to people are actually experiences of misery or experiences of when things went wrong. Oh yeah, commiseration. No, not just commiseration, just like, just imagine what cool story I could get if I tried to drive to some place, got lost, and I found something really fucking weird, and then I come back with a cool story. Yes. I'm gonna remember that way better than if I just oh it was a sunny day, Google Maps worked perfectly, and nothing happened. I don't know. I had one day, one day in my life that felt really perfect, and I remember it. And it was super simple too. Hmm. <sighs> like um like I had the whole day free, drove to the city, ate at my favorite restaurant, I didn't get a second plate. So I was just like the perfect full satisfied. Where you don't want to eat more, even though you could. Drove home, just watched movies. Super, super low key. Super satisfying. Is it an exciting story? No, but my god, that day it was just really, really happy and nice. And no, I get. I've had I've had a couple days like that actually. Like um, I was on, I entered dream dream induced euphoria. I don't fully remember what I was even dreaming about. Just that I was super euphoric off of it. Um, and that lasted for a couple days, and it numbed out any physical pain I was feeling, which was really nice. But then again, I was weird in high school because I valued being asleep over uh, being awake. <laughs> Same. Uh, welcome to literally um, almost everyone. But, but I had crazy lucid dreams uh, during that period, but I preferred the dreams to living out my actual life, so I liked to sleep a lot because it gave me a chance to dream again. I was trying to learn how to lose a dream in high school. I started getting it. I mean, I used to kind of do it, so on paper I know how to do it. It's just I don't, because I kind of like seeing what plays naturally. Because sometimes when I just let it play out, I get, like, really happy about it. Dude, last night, in my dream, I was getting so frustrated. Then after I woke up, I'm like, I really should have recognized that was a lucid dream. So there was some moment where I was trying to type a very simple sentence. I think it was like, how many people have dogs? And I kept having to go back Fireball. and fix the spelling and Ooh. fix this and fix that. And it's like, why is this so hard? I know how to type. And I should have realized, oh, I'm in a dream, but I didn't. Now, like, um, I think one of the things that was kind of a little bit weird, um, I noticed I would dream a lot when I was in the crisis unit. And because so there, was some there was something about psychosis that really, like, it does something to your dreams, like, they become impossibly more vivid. Like, they feel more like drug trips, if anything. Like, it has that level of lucidity to it. But they would have a massive impact on your emotions the next day. Like, to a legitimately terrifying degree, sometimes. Other times it would be awesome. But it all depended on whether you had a good or bad dream, and sometimes you would feel one way or the other for, like, completely random reasons. Oddly enough, all, all my dreams had to do with meeting you guys again. Fucker. You yeah, after the convention, I dreamed about going back to it for like two weeks straight. Yeah, and I still get dreams where I'll imagine seeing you guys again because that was what I thought was most important to me when I was cut off from the world in the CSU because they mm. cut you off from the world. So I've mostly yeah. dreamt about you guys. Aww. Sometimes I'd. The, the weirdest part is that uh, apparently I would astral project in the middle of the crisis unit, which was really weird. You, there are times where you literally just stand up in your room or like lay down and even in the presence of a roommate you just kind of leave your body for a little bit or like you just step into another world within the CSU which already kind of feels like another world it's really weird but sometimes your body just doesn't follow you, you it just kind of stays in the bedroom and then you just get to walk around the, the other CSU in limbo. I mean, my body literally walks around the bedroom when I'm asleep sometimes. Yeah, only here I'm like mentally aware of it, and there were times like even when I was in the little psychotic madness and it went in this apartment, I would like lay down, and suddenly I would like, I would just get this haze over my vision, even though my eyes were shut, and I was like, oh, I'm projecting in the living room now. Okay, this is happening. Well, oh, guess I'm in the living room again. I mean, what I mean by that is, by I guess this is happening is like, 
I'm in the astral world, and I'm just kind of there, and I don't know why, so I'm just like, well, okay, I'm just outside my body now. Okay. You just need to meditate like you've, uh, like you're achieving post-nut clarity. No, there's a Chinese name for that, because it does something to you psychologically, there's a Chinese name for that mindset. It's called post-nut clarity. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's what we call it in the West, but there's a, there's an ancient Chinese name for this. Like, they recognized it a long time ago, but they recognized that um, it would put you into sort of a sam uh, samadhi, samsara-like mindset, or sage-like mindset. So, I think the translation of the Chinese word was, like, sage mind, because you no longer had a sexual distraction blocking you from other, from other material things. So, with a little bit of materialism removed, you were said to make far wiser decisions with much more clarity. Meanwhile, I'm drawing within. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a fucking Naruto technique. Sage mind. <laughs> yeah, just, oh yeah, just do a ton of hand signals and then nut really hard. You muted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just the, uh, the Naruto flute music is playing and, and it's like, yeah. Yeah! <laughs> and then you get, and then your eyes it's like change color. It's like I'm using my secret dojinsu. Sage clarity. Clarity. Science, you're muted if you didn't realize. Okay, but also I want to point out uh, there's a D and D campaign I'm playing with Tricky. Hi, Science. Tricky. Um. Spirit Productions and a few other people. And I was having a conversation between me and. Hey, Science. Um. So I was having a conversation with them, and uh, me and uh, Spirited mentioned that, hey, wait, Spirited, I'm a warlock. What if I could fire, like, Eldritch Blast and Mind Spikes, but do it with a pelvic thrust through my dick? And she's like, yes, you need to do this in the campaign. I will draw this, or something or something like that. So she really loved the idea, is basically what I'm getting at. I'm like, dude, tricky. I'm going to rename my mind, my uh, Eldritch Blast into Mindfuck. And every time uh, my character is going to do it, he does a pelvic thrust to the enemy, and then from his pelvis emits an eldritch beam of pure horror. And I'm going to call it the mind fuck. Is no meaning to the term. You're going to shoot lightning and crap thunder. <laughs> I'm going to teach you to eat danger and crap victory. Ah, that's hilarious. Also, I committed myself slightly too far for this bit because uh, I kind of tapped myself on the nuts a little harder than I'd like to, and, uh... <laughs> Go, okay, bro. Uh, dude. I still have Toradol. That, dude, I took a hit between the legs and didn't even feel it on that stuff. You are scary levels of unfeeling. It's okay. I have, uh... I have accumulated all of my martial prowess into ignoring the slight pain in my junk. Okay, uh, I'm also gonna- Okay, mine was more than slight, so I'll give you that, but... Uh, I will say something about martial prowess. Uh, one of the other guys in the Crisis Unit was on, like, severe nerve pain throughout most of his stay in there, and I didn't even notice. And apparently all of that is just from military discipline. Mm. Like, you d he would not show any of it just from pure discipline that he acquired in his life. But apparently he was in extreme agony for most of his time there. Mm. I also want to point out, he was crazy. He was the one that you're not supposed to... He was the patient, the number one patient that you weren't supposed to fuck with, because uh, of the technicians, he didn't want to fuck with Justin or Cole because they're ex-military. He didn't want to fuck with any of them, but especially not Justin. Um... And of the patients, he didn't want to fuck with Carl. Because Carl, the one in Extreme Agony, was able to fuck up a violent schizophrenic. Somehow. You haven't met D&D &D Carl yet, have you? Sorry, what? You haven't met D&D &D Carl yet, have you? Carl the Stable Boy. No, oh, no. You <laughs> didn't want to fuck with Carl. Um, yeah, no, I still, I still want to know, though, what did this Carl, like... The one from the asylum. I wanted to know what he did to mess up with uh, the schizophrenic patient because, you know, he tried. That patient tried to attack me twice, but then suddenly he tries to pick a fight with Carl. We don't see what happens. Just that Patrick is running away like a scared animal, and the nurse is like, "He can't be next to him anymore. Like, 
he needs to be way down the hall from him. And like, dude, he, he looks like a scared animal. And then I look, me and uh, Jordan were just like, what happened? And then we look down the hall, we see Carl, who looks mildly irritated, straightens his appearance at and goes back to having a slight smile like he always does, and then walks back into his room. Probably was about to give him some capital justice. Well, well I mean, I know the other thing is that um, Carl's ex-military. So if they were to get into a physical fight, Carl would have won. Mm -hmm. Oh dear. Because what what is it? Patrick Patrick kind of looks like a, a skinhead from the street, but he you can tell he's like hyper insecure. He's like hyper insecure if he's not the dominant person in the room. Oh, okay. uh, uh, oh nice. I have so much con I have so much concern. Well, I mean, he was locked in there because he was a threat to both himself and others, so, you know, that's kind of the requirement for yeah. getting in there, is you pose a threat to yourself or others, and they can't release you until you're not. And, uh, yeah, he was a bit of a threat to himself and others. Poor thing. I mean, I could tell he wasn't doing it intentionally. Like, he genuinely thought he was hearing voices, so I don't really hold it against him. Poor thing. Mm -hmm. I, you don't want to be around him, though. You, you wouldn't want to be no. around him, though. No, 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 no. I, I, I get it. I'd probably be, like, keeping a safe distance, regardless. But I still can't help with the pity. Because yeah. it is sad to know that that's what happened to him. Poor guy. Okay, where the hair... Schizophrenia can be terrifying, man. Oh, uh, yep. I've, I've read enough, um... I read enough ca uh, medical cases when it came to stuff like that. I I've watched a lot of TV shows that happens when people are considered schizophrenic. It is very terrifying. No, I, what I really love is that, like, um, when you get, like, someone who who's, like, a young kid, and they think that being hyperactive means crazy, or, like, being hyperactive and random is, like, somehow equivalent to, like, oh, I'm insane, look out! I'm gonna fuck you up. I'm I'm so I'm so unique and interesting. And then and then you and then you find out they like they don't know anyone who actually has the condition. Yeah, they don't know anyone who actually has the condition. They're just they just know that being random on a sugar high is funny to some people. Because I love when people talk. Oh no, but you can go ahead. I I have one more thing to say after, but you go ahead. Like, I was like that when I was younger, but I knew I wasn't crazy. Everyone else told me I was crazy. Right, yeah, because that was during the age when, yeah, the sugar highs were doing it. But I love walking into a room and people are like, oh, my God, I'm crazy, I'm psycho. And then I just do the green text plus I'm like, it's actually diagnosed as psychotic. I'm like, you are so adorable. <laughs> I'll kiss my ass. God damn it. So, so but I love how all those people just like shut up the moment you the moment I mentioned like, oh, I'm actually diagnosed. I'm diagnosed and you know nothing of our work. <laughs> they granted, I don't think I have it anymore. Because I think my medicine's purged it, but still. Uh thank thank you God for natural medicine. So awesome. Thank you for having a brain that naturally seems to have more dopamine and serotonin than the average person. That's pretty awesome. Oh yeah, it would be. Um, the only thing higher dopamine would ever put you at risk of is like Parkinson's. Yeah, likely. One of my uncles had that. Yeah, because a uh, common thing, like, because most of the stuff with Parkinson's is also coincidentally a lot has to do with having too much dopamine. And I don't mean just mean a little bit more. I mean like too much. Like, because then, because it controls your little motion, so you'll have, like, body tremors. Um, that's what causes them. Uh, also, everything is now meaningful, because dopamine is the meaning chemical. And if you get too lost into that, then you get a little bit, you might get schizophrenia that way, because a common feature of schizophrenics is that everything is meaningful, and they can't turn it off. Or menu. <laughs> Cutlet web.
Hey, little scorpion <laughs> Pokemon, I, I, I would like that you don't start attacking me right now. I'm looking for Diglets in here. Don't mind me! <laughs> I, I don't think that they give a shit if you're looking for Diglets. <laughs> I was saying that to anybody in the chat and in the stream. Okay. Because I'm... Uh, okay. Um, okay. Okay. Buddy water. Okay. Cool. Take off. Everyone need water. I'm going good. All right. Oh, water is delicious. Um. Hey, Myth, you might get a kick out of this, even though you're probably not surprised at all that it happened. Uh, shout, okay. shout out to Dusclair. Uh, or aka Syrup Mama, she is great, and she told me about something because she's from Quebec called the Great Canadian Maple Syrup Heist. Um, it was the largest heist in Canadian history, and it involved there being a bank of maple syrup stores. Uh, yes, um, and, they ha and they have a bank of syrup that has all the surplus syrup because there's a government committee that controls how much syrup Canada is allowed to make. So if you make any extra, you have to lock it inside this bank to be sold later. Or in the event of a national emergency where there is a shortage on syrup, the government has control over this bank of syrup to release in an emergency crisis. I'm not shitting you. That's that's 100% real. Okay. Um, that's like brown gold. Yeah, so so essentially, there were 18 million barrels ah, of syrup. So, what ends up happening next is they realize that, oh crap, some of these drums are rusting and they're filled with water, something's going on. And it involved uh, someone renting out a forklift and this guy who was opposed to the committee working with a notorious, I'm not even shitting it, notorious black market maple syrup dealer. And this is real in Canada because remember how, no, here's why that makes sense. No, here's why that makes sense. In Canada, because it's controlled by government committee, some corporations that produce or companies that produce syrup don't like that. So what they do is they go to a black market maple syrup dealer to sell them their syrup and they get the profits back from it completely under the table. Because they don't have to report um, any surplus syrup they have, just they just have to send it to that agency where it's then counted there. So if you just give this guy your barrels, no one's any the wiser. Hence why the uh, black market maple syrup dealers will take your surplus, export it out to like Japan, the US, and Britain, and then give you a cut of the profit from whatever they get out there. What is this? Is it Mrs. Buttersworth in a trench coat? <laughs> oh, dude, Butter Buttersworth is so shit tier up there. Like, up, if, you, if you grew up up north, you were spoiled by quality syrup. So but, but no, dude, it's it's like I, I just thought it was so funny that it involves a syrup heist and a, a notorious syrup thief who apparently was busted for something years earlier, also involving the theft of maple syrup, and a notorious maple syrup black market dealer who is assisting him in the cash operation. Just imagine like a junkie scratches his neck asking, "Hey, you got that amber?" And he gets a syringe of maple spirits, maple syrup, and it's just like, ah, that's a good, that's a good stuff. Spirup. No, but I just find it so funny. And it, this was the biggest heist in Canadian history. That's, that's really It funny. was like eight, it was like tens of millions of dollars of maple syrup was stolen. That is a lot of syrup. The stuff just writes itself, folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that is so the most... It is the most Canadian thing I can think of. There was a maple syrup heist. It was the most expensive thing in the country. And black market maple syrup dealer. That's almost sounds, a stereotype. This sounds like an SNL skit. Yeah. I know, bad. right? <laughs> Doesn't even sound real. It's so funny. <laughs> it sounds like a, a stereotype. It sounds like a stereotypical Canadian thing written by a non-Canadian. Like, a non-Canadian who's only heard stereotypes of Canada, and yet somehow this actually happens. And that's the thing, the fact that it actually happened makes it even funnier. Yeah, this was 2010, by the way, 2010 to 2011 or so. 
Oh, what's that? Oh, nothing. It's just that you can't make this shit up a lot. Um. <laughs> see, that made an agreement. It's like, I want your syrup. I miss it. And she's like, okay, here's the deal. We, in Canada, we treat syrup like guns. So trade me a few guns and I'll give you some jugs of premium syrup. Mm, delicious. Yes. Yes. This is indeed a fair trade. Stocks. <laughs> I will sell you my handgun for maple syrup, please. This is maple syrup. This is Buttersworth. You are cheating me over, boy. After I finish writing this commission note, I think I'm ahead to bed. Alright. No problem. So, in a little while. There Crocodiles? Uh, no, because I'm not leaving. I'm saying, you know, I see you, Kikyo. Hello. Hello, Kikyo. Kikyo, yay! It's Kikyo Yaoi. Yep. Yeah, it's always been that. Yeah, she said Kikyo yay. I'm correcting her. I am oh, dad. <laughs> Did you say no. you're dad? I, I am dad. Hi, Dad. I'm dead. No, Dad. I'm dead. 